Okay, welcome back. Um, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to open our first fireside chat discussion uh, with Sandra Odendahl. Um, so a bit of a bio on Sandra, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw something in that, that she's not prepared for. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so first off, Sandra is uh, the senior, currently senior vice president at head of sustainability and diversity at the Business Development Bank of Canada, where she just joined, I guess what was a couple of months ago, uh, April uh, 2022, after uh, with over 25 years of experience in environmental science, uh, corporate sustainability and responsible finance. And prior to that, she was the VP and uh, global head of sustainability at Scotiabank. Uh, where she led a team responsible for corporate sustainability, uh, social impact management, and ESG reporting. Um, Sandra's uh, undergrad is from the University of, of Ottawa uh, in chemical engineering, and she did her master's here, right, at U of T. And um, I was actually talking, there's a long history at, at U of T of, of you know, me becoming, coming through the system. Greg Evans, as I just reminded him, was my TA. Um, but Sandra, I don't know if you remember, but it was memorable for me is that you were the TA for a unit ops lab that I went through in undergrad chem I remember it was the leaching experiment. And I remember, it, it, for some reason, it stuck in my head as to, you know, and, and, and actually an awesome impact for experiential learning for me to actually have you as my TA. So I really enjoyed that. That set me down the path. So I'm going to give you full props for that, Sandra. So I, so I bring back that story. <laughs> I wish you were here because I don't, I, don't I don't remember if you remember the mark I got in it, but I think I did all right in the course. I just remember, <laughs> I just remember stuff going down the column, changing colors. We were leaching it through the experiment. So, anyways, Unirop still remains a, a, a huge opportunity for our students. And so, anyways, so welcome, Sandra. Very happy to have you here today. Chris, I feel like you must have done well in uh, <laughs> in that lab uh, and others. <laughs> All I know is it was it was a ton of fun. Uh, you were a great TA. Um, okay, so so. Uh, let me, uh, I get, you know, there's a bit of a fireside chat, a bit of a casual conversation, but we started a little bit of a year back. I won't ask you about what you remember about being a TA too much, but um, your education was, was you know, obviously with the master's from U of T, it was all in Chem Eng. And I know a lot of our students are interested in where are, where, how you get into these, all, these different careers and how you've gone over the, you know, 25 years into the finance uh, sector now, actually, this 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 transition um, it was interesting. I think when we invited you, you were with Scotiabank, and then we got this email saying, "Whoa, I've just transitioned to the Business Development Bank." And so, um, could you maybe tell uh, tell us a little bit about how you went through that transition to um, into the financial industry, but also how that has be, how your background in ChemEng has been relevant now for what your current role is. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for including me in Research Day. I'm, I'm so, um, so honored to be here. You know, typical engineering work for people who work on environmental projects in engineering and have to understand industrial processes. Um, and then when working in a mining um, project actually in Southeast Asia, uh, in early in my career, I got really curious about the bankers who got to fly in every week on that private jet on the little tiny airstrip in this little tiny town, mining town that we were in, in Sulawesi, Indonesia. 
and you know they'd step off the plane with their you know their I, this was like a long time ago but their pressed chin you know, and their you know their golf shirts and looking really you know uh, business casual while we were schlepping sample bottles and steel toed boots and a hard hat and sweat and I had all broken fingernails and I thought yeah, you know, I wonder how you do that job someday. <laughs> so, um, uh, not that I didn't love what I was doing, but of course, uh, it ended up um, through some contacts through the bankers who were working um, on financing this particular big project. I ended up um, getting recruited by RBC um, to be a natural resource sector analyst. So it was sort of a natural, you know, uh, segue, not a complete detour. Um, so it wasn't an environmental job, but it was uh, definitely uh, the the uh, person who hired me was very keen on the fact that, you know, there's a lot of, he said, I can't swing a cat in this place without hitting an MBA from Western. But I don't have anybody who actually has been to a pulp mill or a mine or a hydro dam, understands how they work, and can add that lens to the analysis when we do our sector analysis where we put our portfolio of financing. So that. That's how I got into banking. Um, and I would say, you know, one other thing about that is that there are actually a lot of engineers who work in finance. Um, and I think, uh, first of all, uh, you know, the engineering um, skill of uh, being able to identify, unpack, and solve a problem is, is like, it's, it's our secret sauce. Like, you can apply that is so useful in everything. There should be engineers working in every sector because there's a lot of times when people run off to solve things and they haven't bothered to make sure they understand the problem. And I think we are trained to not do things that way. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, I think to, to like, you know, comfort with math, creative thinking. And then obviously in my case, um, after I joined RBC as an analyst, um, very shortly into it, I actually, uh, I sort of kept close to the very small team um, that was doing environmental risk management in the bank. And when the head of that team announced his retirement, I was actually sort of fast-tracked to take over that role. And that was 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. And from then on, I and I thought I was only going to stay in finance for a couple of years because it was a bit of a detour. And it was there's so many, many jobs in finance, so many jobs in banking. You work with every sector in the whole economy. Um, so it, it's really a perfect place to have real impact and in my case, to uh, really try to move the needle on sustainability um, across a lot of different sectors. Um, and with BDC, the added um, benefit is BDC is a purpose-driven organization. It's a crown corp. It's mandate. It has one shareholder, and that's all of us. So the shareholder is the government of Canada. And um, so its mandate is, you know, economic growth, job creation, and uh, reflecting the values of Canada while making money. So it's, uh, it's a real win-win. Great, thanks for that. The, um, I think you touched on so many important points about how engineering is so foundational, regardless of the discipline, but then also how we sort of uh, kind of give our students that opportunity to get to think about how they can leverage and, and ask questions and, and pursue different trajectories once they're uh, off on their careers. I remember well, when I went through, obviously I went through undergrad in ChemEng, and we had that opportunity to do economic analysis, this third year or course that we all take, and we're kind of like, why do I have to learn about this? Then you realize time value of money, and in, in ChemEng and plant design, thinking about the economics of the processes, and we're seeing so many of our students now moving into this intersection, right, between finance, the banking industry, uh, leveraging these problems. Um, I think the analogy that Chemeng plants are like banks and inflow and outflow and profits and products. There's terrific analogies there. Um, and I, I think also uh, what you said about when you go into these different industries and different opportunities and just learning and asking questions and seeing how it can, uh, how they all come together. And it's something that we want to really make sure our students think about as well as they go into their careers that you're not locked into a particular discipline. Um, the, the, hard hat, but then seeing someone come in on the private jet, though, I think that's kind of a nice analogy as well. I think that's a, that's a timely I one haven't too. had a lot of private jet rides, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was aspirational at the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, 
Now that you're at BDC, I, I wanted to maybe ask a quick, a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, you're focused on sustainability, and you did talk about sort of the sustainability side, but also sort of, you know, the shareholder context. Can you give some examples of, of what BDC's sustainability strategies uh, are? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess, um, I mean, <laughs> well, uh, their strategy, their overarching sustainability strategy is going to be completely um, nailed down over the next um, 12 weeks <laughs> um, because that's uh, one of my first jobs but BDC is doing a lot on sustainability and um, as I mentioned first of all um, you know just to make remind everybody sustainability right the three pillars economic social and environmental and there's always a, there's always for me the exciting and intriguing part of this this area is that it, it is always all about trade-offs. You cannot, you cannot move the needle aggressively on any one of those without affecting the others, and you have to be conscious of, as a society and as a, as citizens, of what you're willing, what trade-offs you're willing to make. And I think that's a really important concept that people, um, uh, I, I hope everybody takes away in any conversation about sustainability, in any debates about what we should do on sustainability, it's that you can't go really hard on something without a whole bunch of other things um, maybe not being very positive. So you have to decide how to do it uh, in a way that's acceptable to everyone. Um, so on that, um, on that, that note, as I mentioned earlier, so on the economic pillar of sustainability, um, you know, BDC has this pretty well uh, locked down, I would say, and there's always more to do, but, um, you know, having uh, the mandate of um, supporting economic growth and job creation by helping, you know, essentially making Canada a great place to start and grow a business, that is a huge piece of the sustainability stool, and that is, it, it's core to BDC, it, it's what everybody goes to work every day to do, so that's, um, that's great. Um, I guess uh, in terms of the environmental and social aspects of sustainability, um, again, a little bit of context. Um, you know, small and so BDC is the bank for entrepreneurs. It serves small and medium-sized businesses and startups, and, and, and so, um, and it does it through financing, through advisory services, so lending, advisory services, and um, they have a number of investment funds like the clean tech fund and so on. So. Um, you know, small and medium-sized businesses are about half of Canada's GDP, and they contribute about a third of, of Canada's GHG emissions. So, you know, uh, innovative entrepreneurial companies um, play a, a role in both things like uh, decarbonization, which is a big, obviously, big environmental question right now, but also helping develop the technical solutions that is going to that are going to be scalable, that are going to help big companies and industries address pollution, including GHGs. So in terms of BDC strategy, um, it's very much about um, enabling um, small businesses and startups to, um, to activate their own sustainability you know, strategies and efforts, but also enabling them to contribute to the innovation that we need throughout the economy. So small businesses are both um, you know, actors and enablers in terms of uh, environmental progress. And also in uh, social progress, another, you know, another important piece of um, BDC strategy, particularly in recent years, is extensively um, launching initiatives to support diversity and inclusion in the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So, for example, you know, we have a Women in Technology Venture Fund. We've got a Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund. There's an Indigenous Growth Fund. Um, so those are all parts of the, uh, the, str the strategy of making sure that we can provide, uh, you know, the full range of services to, um, to enable sustainability with small businesses in Canada. Great. Uh, thank you for that. The, um, I think when you, when you started out, it really pointed out that the need to understand all the interrelationships between all these different topics. And again, something sort of multifaceted, complex problems, which are kind of what engineers like to work with, right? Um, ones where we don't know that the, there's no mathematical formula that applies, but we need to consider all the variables that we can pull into. And I think you nicely illustrated that in a couple of those examples that you just gave. Um, the, uh, 
you, you hinted at it towards the end with the, with the uh, comment on equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and this is around the sort of the social impact angle. Uh, it, it's a key part of the sustainability mandate. What, what sort of programs, you mentioned some of the ones, you know, supporting uh, entrepreneurship, black entrepreneurship, and so and founders. Um, what other, or, or other types of programs do you think will make an impact in that space? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, we're, we're looking across the board. Um, and, uh, and I would say the important thing in looking at, um, you know, applying um, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. And when I heard a great acronym the other day, JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So it's like JEDI. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a freebie. Um, so the, that's, a, uh, that's a great acronym. The, <laughs> Yeah, you gotta love acronyms. I have a whole uh, list of them in my notebook. <laughs> having started a new company, it's like, what does this mean? Um, the um, the important thing that, as we're looking at DEI programs, is that you have to look at them at, in almost on three layers, um, and that that goes for environmental ones as well. Um, it's what are you doing in your own, in, you know, getting your own house in order. So you know, your own suppliers and supply chain, your workforce, um, you know, the way that you advertise, your IT um, programming, whatever. So there's the, what are we doing for d and I internally in-house? What are we doing it um, in um, product services advice, whatever our product is to our clients? And then what are we doing to support and enable it for, for Canada and the world? So. We're looking at it in three layers. Um, as I mentioned, there's a number of um, initiatives underway, particularly in um, in our lending and um, in our um, uh, investment, uh, like equity investing um, funds to um, to provide targeted financing to um, underrepresented groups. Um, but uh, as we're looking at you know, it's early days for me. I've literally been on the job three weeks, <laughs> so I kind of laughed when you said a couple of months. It's like, no, <laughs> it's um, it's not quite a month. Um, so it's really early days. But what we're looking at doing is we want to um, actually, there's a lot of um, internal, uh, obviously, D&I programs going on to make sure we're attracting the right talent, um, to make sure that people feel included and, you know, um, that there's... Um, uh, efforts to make sure that unconscious biases are are addressed and et cetera. So a lot of stuff in house, supplier diversity, number of different programs. What we're what's important now is knitting it together in a cohesive strategic direction. You know, principles um, guiding us so that we have um, the ability to actually measure and report on the impact. What are our key performance indicators and what's the impact that we want to make in house. Uh, with our clients and in Canada and in the world. Um, I would say, uh, you know, one other thing about that, a lesson learned actually from Scotiabank in terms of de devising impactful social programs, um, if I may, uh, the, you know, I was, um, I was lucky enough uh, to join Scotiabank uh, several years ago, right at the time when they were trying to put some, organize their social impact efforts and impacts and strategies and so I um, I set up the and helped develop and launch something called Scotia Rise which is um, which is a 10-year 500 million dollar um, community investment program um, that's to um, move the needle on economic resilience and economic inclusion and um, one of the things that we did when we developed Scotia Rise starting in 2020 is that we started by you know, I made everybody ask the question, like, what is the problem that we want to solve? Let's make sure we define it. What are the problems out there to be solved from a social perspective, and there's no shortage? And then let's funnel that through what are the problems that we should be solving based on what resonates with our clients that are solvable by a private company. So we sort of, we, we basically focused on what is the problem to be solved? What's the problem to be solved by us? And then what are all the things that contribute to the problem? And in our case, we thought economic resilience was the problem. So people that either 
couldn't even get a leg up on the economic ladder or they were very precariously perched or they had sort of hit a ceiling because they were facing barriers that weren't of their own making. And so we looked at that and we, again, very deliberately looked at what are the things that contribute to people not having enough economic resilience, desktop research, um, lots of discussions with community organizations and individuals. And we landed on three pillars for the strategy, high school completion, newcomer integration, and supporting career advancement for um, underrepresented groups. So we took a very, you'd be proud, took a very engineering -y kind of approach to it, very systematic. And, um, and it, it, was, um, it was very enthusiastically, and is very enthusiastically supported. So learned a lot about um, starting with, um, start with the why, um, start with like, what is it you're trying to accomplish and then take it from there. That sounds like a, a, a terrific program, one that has a tremendous impact. The, uh, we were talking about acronyms earlier and, I, and um, uh, an, an interesting acronym that just came up at a meeting we were just at, which relates to this concept around uh, diversity inclusion was um, there's sort of EDI, there's DEI, and we we're just at a meeting and someone said, well, actually rearrange it. You had JEDI, and the other one was sort of IDEA. So inclusion, oh. diversity, equity, and then the A was accessibility. And that nice. actually makes a really nice acronym. I, I'm not gonna take credit for that. That came from a colleague, another, former, another engineering dean. And I think that's actually another one which very nicely in, um, couples in with what you actually just described, right? Accessibility to opportunities, accessibility to, uh, to strategies, accessibility to programs, uh, something that we're interested in, in engineering in particular, as well as providing an alternative access uh, to our programs. Um, but I think, as you described with your Scotia Rise initiative, that same sort of idea, right? Helping uh, identifying the problem and, and giving people roots uh, into uh, that, 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 those topics. Um, I wanted to ask, maybe go back to Scotiabank a little bit as well. Um, you talked about the Scotia Rise program. Um, what, what sort of projects in, in the environmental uh, sustainability space w were you driving when you were at Scotiabank? Am I frozen, or are you? Uh, you? Well, I hear your voice right now. <laughs> your video, oh, there we go. Hello? Hello? Are you back? There you I'm go. Back. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was, was going to ask the question around, um, you talked a little bit about your Scotia Rise project. Um, and the impact it had, um, and, and that from the social impact side, I was asking a little bit uh, more, I guess, history around the Scotiabank and its environmental uh, sustainability type projects that uh, you were also involved in. I wonder if you could give us a few examples there. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, well, actually, even before I, um, before I joined Scotiabank in 2019, um, when I was, um, I was actually running a, a carbon technology company, um, and we also did advisory uh, work. And um, I worked for Scotiabank. Um, they were my client in helping develop their climate change strategy um, or their climate commitments. And um, so that was, uh, that was a very interesting um, project as well. So that involved, um, you know, that was something that it was very important to get a lot of buy-in across the businesses and across the organization because having a climate strategy was going to mean people were going to have to figure out how to change the way they did their jobs if they were in the lending or in um, you know responsible um, investment products so lending wealth management you know uh, corporate banking risk management um, and operations. So it was going to affect a lot of different business and functional units. So um, what we did in developing um, the climate commitments was um, we knew that uh, there had to be sort of commitments and aspirations in a few key pillars. And in a bank, it's, um, you know, again, what are you doing with your products and services? What are you doing in your own operations? In a bank, risk management is huge, so it's its own pillar. 
because banks are risk managing machines. Um, and then what are you doing with, um, you know, your stakeholders, your, um, your, you know, collaboration, both internally and externally, knowledge building, all that stuff. And then over it all, how are you uh, managing and governing it? So that was sort of the framework for the climate change strategy. And um, with that, at the time, um, we came out with a fairly ambitious commitment for Scotiabank to, um, you know, to, to basically mobilize at least $100 billion in financing um, by 2025. Um, and then actually, just this past March, um, after um, working on a net zero strategy for Scotiabank um, over the last uh, almost a year, again, with a large group of people uh, from across the different parts of the bank, um, we launched our net zero strategy on March 15th. It's actually online. Um, and um, we upped our, uh, our um, climate-related financing commitment to $350 billion by 2030. And, and there's other commitments as well, you know, commitments to decarbonize operations, um, by a certain date, um, commitments to, um, you know, internally a commitment to make sure people had the right kind of training and tools. So that's um, that's a really important, um, I think that's a really important strategic area for a lot of organizations, including banks. And uh, a lot of the environmental side of work at Scotia focused on climate. Um, in some ways, I would say, I, one thing I will say is that it's not like we've solved all the other environmental problems. And, um, you know, having come from a background of environmental impact assessment, um, the really, really deep focus that everyone has on climate as the environmental issue now is both great and also a little bit like, I think we're missing some stuff that's also really important, um, that's not top of mind, and obviously it's all connected. So. I think we'll get there. Um, so the good news is everybody's talking about the environment in a way. The bad news is they think it. Some a lot of people think it starts and stops with climate change. It's, these are such challenging we'll problems. Yeah, these are such challenging problems. I think it's it's interesting to see how the organizations themselves internally have to to work on projects, and then in the context of a bank or the financial industry, how you're supporting the technologies and the new technologies that are coming down the pipe, and and sort of. Um, I'm not saying pressuring, but sort of getting companies and, and everyone on board and, and how do we work together collaboratively to kind of drive these initiatives forward. Um, and in, in that context, I was going to ask a, 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 I'm not sure if it's a loaded question, but a little bit of a question about how do you see the role of, of collaboration between, um, you know, sort of industries, uh, the universities, the financial industry in particular in this space, what role do you see the universities playing um, in this, in the context? We obviously do our talent development, um, mm -hmm. but what about our other, um, our, the other components? Yeah, um, you know, I think that's a, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I do think there's value, and I, I don't know the like what the best mechanisms are, but there's definitely value in working together to find solutions to complex long-term problems. I mean, things that require rigorous research, data, you know, an understanding of how the world and systems work. Um, certainly in order to make sure that we're applying financing in the right place and to the right problems. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about climate change um, biodiversity loss, economic inequality, infrastructure deficit. These are all things where the financial sector is being tapped to provide capital to help address these pre problems. But we have to make sure that we understand exactly, you know, the systemic, the, the, the ecosystem around these problems, again, so that we're, we're solving and financing the right things that are actually going to move the needle and not just what the first thing somebody thought might work to move the needle. Um, so it really requires a good cross-section of knowledge and skills before the bankers can come in to fund it. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think that's one thing. I think, uh, yeah, and you touched on this a bit earlier, um, you know, I think it's, it's also good to make sure engineers know that, um, especially if they're thinking about a second degree or, you know, having a cross cross-pollinating their own skills, that finance is a really good 
complementary area to, um, to have skills in. And finance needs more scientists and engineers, for sure. And I think engineering needs, you know, as you said, the, the economics course we all had to take that we were like, why are we taking this? <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, now I get it. <laughs> it. It wasn't always about trying to figure out how much money I have to save to buy a house. Um, now it's more about how do we, how do we bring money to make our collective house uh, in order, as it were. Um, the, uh, an interesting sort of transition here, I sort of, we're talking about the industry research side and, and our talent development, but I think another thing that, that universities are doing a terrific job at right now um, shameless plug to our entrepreneurship and the hatchery in engineering is really this idea of, of it, um, empowering our students and our faculty to, to take their research and, and move it in, right? Be entrepreneurial about it, uh, move it into new companies, into small startups and, and engagement in that particular sphere, right? These are how do we get these technologies that are in the lab now? How do we translate them out? Um, how do we identify which ones are going to um, which one should we bet on in a sense, right? Um, this is kind of what the granting councils do, like let us do curiosity driven, but which ones of those will lead to significant changes uh, or improvements in the system? And I know that um, you're involved with a number of different uh, organizations like Next Canada and, and, and those sorts of opportunities. How, how do you see um, uh, uh, organizations like Next Canada helping the entrepreneurship and, and keeping this sort of Canadian talent pool here and, and encouraging our students to go into that particular space? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you covered uh, a lot of it. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, universities play such an important role in um, like creating, like enabling innovation and, and entrepreneurial activities. So you've got, you know, you've got the, the right culture, the facilities, the talent um, that really can help us come to breakthrough ideas. Um, I think that, um, so with Next Canada, so for anyone who doesn't know Next, it's a, it's a not-for-profit, it's based in Toronto, um, and it supports young entrepreneurs by giving them access to really specialized education and mentorship and funding. Um, and it, and it's, it's comprises a network of actually a lot of people who are academics at different um, academic institutions, um, successful entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that are still getting started, uh, and then investors and founders, uh, you know, founders of companies. They all work together to uh, there's, and Next has a few different programs to um, basically help companies incubate, accelerate their, um, their ideas and turn them into real companies that are successful. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the role of um, academia and the universities is, is huge here. Um, as you said, like it's the talent, um, but I think um, courses and programs that um, I'm even thinking like postgraduate courses and programs that give people professional knowledge, um, or it doesn't even have to be postgraduate. I don't know. Maybe they're like extra, you know, outside of, um, you know, I've been out of school too long. Uh, like the <laughs> things that are not compulsory, non-compulsory courses, but where you could learn how to start a company. Um, you know, how do I start and run a business? Entrepreneurship 101. I think universities play a role in that type of education that, like we we've been talking about, that cross-pollination education. Um, I think there's also um, lots of great examples of universities partnering on collab collaborative projects with large and small companies. I mean, I was a student at uh, the inaugural Pulp and Paper Center at U of T, um, you know, that Doug Reeve was one of the pioneers of this idea, I think, of having... Um, you know, university research and graduate students working on things with a fairly long-term time horizon, which is different from a lot of corporate work, but with corporations deeply um, invested in both financially and in terms of strategically invested in the outcomes and, and the practical use of the research. So that kind of partnership is huge for probably maybe lighting the entrepreneurial spark in um, in um, students and um, and academics as well. Yeah, we see increasingly this this idea of building partnerships uh, between industry and universities. 
uh, as you hinted with the work that, that Doug did in the Pulp and Paper Center, it often has a longer time frame, um, you know, and it, you know, multiple PhDs and sort of this, the, that framework. But we also increasingly are seeing short-term projects, ones which are very applied, immediate impact. Uh, but it's all part of a continuum. And something that we're really interested in is, is uh, being able to fill that continuum, keeping companies uh, aware of the technologies that are being developed here and, and, and seeding ideas in a, in a true collaboration, right, of, of how do we get the, uh, the innovation, the creativity that our students and our faculty have, how do we translate into immediate problems that maybe industry is facing, but also to get them to be also thinking about the longer term timeline. Um, what are some of these big uh, initiatives that we need to start to build um, the, the talent in that particular space and, and start thinking about solutions for those problems. It's, it's, it's to borrow a ChemEng analogy, it's all a giant feedback loop in a sense. Uh, we need to be working closely with industry, working with all the different sectors together on these problems if we really want to get to, to concrete and sustainable solutions. And I think it's, a, it's an important lesson. Um, uh, I, I was going to draw on what you just said about it's been a long time since you've been at school. One of the things we're interested in, in training our students is the idea of lifelong learning. And actually, we welcome our alums to come back um, and, and actually engage in courses uh, with us again. And in fact, to keep up to date with what's happened in the field, for instance. And we're really in, interested in those opportunities. Uh, but also to bring back, I'm just going to another shameless plug, bring back those who have been in industry to be our instructors. So if you're interested in being an adjunct and, and you know, giving, giving uh, uh, courses, we'd be happy to, uh, to sign you up on the dotted line for that one if you're intrigued <laughs> by that opportunity. Well, three weeks into a new job, I'm going to say maybe not, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get you in the but, next academic year. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think there's, uh, there, there's, there's so much that we can learn from our, from our alums, especially in this such an important sector that you're working in right now to really see how uh, that core foundational training that you, you had in during, how it helped transition you into the financial sector, but now into the, the, the sustainability sector, into the social impact sector, um, how it's all come together. And, and it's been amazing to see uh, uh, the impact you've had and, and, and really looking forward to, to what you're going to be doing at BDC because it's such an important sector, right? Providing the resources uh, for, for this, these technologies to be translated uh, provide accessibility and, and especially in the social impact sphere. Um, so it's been a, I think it'd been a tremendous conversation. Thank you so much, Sandra. I hope you feel better. <laughs> kind of, I kind of, it, this is awkward. I'm staring, staring up at the giant screen at you. Um, <laughs> it, it would have been terrific to have you uh, in person here today and, and being part of the conversation, but I hope you are feeling better soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I candidly, I'm probably going to um, finish my uh, tea and uh, go lie down. But <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I am triple vaxxed, as I hope everybody is. And so apparently, um, when you do have COVID and you're triple vaxxed, it, um, it's not as bad as it could be. So I'm hanging, I'm hanging on to that hope. We'll hang in there. Uh, hope you feel better soon. We look forward to, uh, to seeing you in person. Um, alumni reunions coming up in a couple of weeks. Maybe you'll be feeling better you get a chance to come back yeah. on the campus for that. So with that, I'd like to thank you so much again, Sandra, for, uh, for being part of our, our first fireplace, fireplace fireside chat uh, on Engineering Research Day on this important topic of sustainability. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Have a great, uh, have a great research day. Bye-bye. So with that, I think we now pivot to a break, I believe, right? And we will be back uh, in a few minutes, in 10 minutes. Adrian was giving me the, that was either the stop sign or that was the 10 minute sign. I wasn't quite sure what he's doing. <laughs> uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes uh, uh, for a panel discussion.